My name is Michael. This is basically going to be our chronological order of how we've kind of achieved where we're at right now with Airflow and the struggles and bumps along the way and some of our achievements that we've kind of gotten to. Um, so that being said, might as well jump into it. A little bit about me. This is just a smorgasbord of education that I've absolutely gone through. Pretty much just telling you and detailing you that I had zero idea about what I actually wanted to achieve right out of high school. And even throughout college, as you can finally tell with the graduate certificate through data engineering, finally got somewhere with it. And all that pretty much tells you is that I had no idea what Airflow was just yet a few years ago. And this is how far I've actually come with it. Um, so don't sell yourself short with anything that you see with Airflow. It has way more capacity to grow than what you actually want to give it credit for. And a little bit about Panasonic. So Panasonic Energy, um, you might just know it, just, but for everyone around us, we call it Pena, which is Panasonic Energy of North America. We are the industry leader in battery technology. Um, and we try to basically provide the batteries for the EV vehicles that are out there. Um, and our main consumer is going to be Tesla. We are actually a part of the Gigafactory, so Tesla is the omnipresence that we end up having all around us. Um, they are the people who drive everything that we do there at the factory, and we are basically a 50-50 split inside of that factory itself. And I know that our president, uh, as well as our CEO would be very upset if I did not say what our mission was, and that is to deliver high-performance, reliable battery solutions that empower electric mobility and renewable energy adoption. Alrighty, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Before, before Airflow, everyone knows, or at least knows the struggles of running things locally, and we were no different. We ended up having Windows Task Scheduler and a dream. Uh, we ended up having pretty much Python just running locally on a physical PC, and that was just out there, um, in, plugged into the wall, plugged in uh, somewhere out there in our common floor area. So if anyone ended up unplugging that, we all had to rush, come in, and see what exactly was happening with those scripts and why exactly they were not running when they were scheduled to be running. Uh, aside from that, we're also running a MySQL data mart, as well as just parsing through CSVs from a file share directory and sending, sending messages and emails via Python code to majority teams channels uh, and teams locations and groups. And then along came our first iteration of Airflow, which was Airflow 1.0. Airflow 1 for us. We ended up getting that off the ground, having it all kind of set up in the kind of wonky way. Um, we have this now as kind of our more legacy system all throughout the factory. Um, a lot of these scripts aren't necessarily touched, but we have gone through and augmented quite a bit um, going forward. And as you can kind of tell, our first iteration is not exactly ETL'd out like you'd kind of expect it to be. Uh, it is just a single command. Uh, if you are familiar with just a death main, this is exactly what that is. You read it from the top all the way to the bottom. It is an unholy mess. And I do not suggest any of you guys just throw things into a death main. Um, please ETL it out. Uh, for the sanity of whoever is next and has to read that code next for you. Here's a nice little example of one of our data pullers that we ended up having. It is basically just put into a Docker image, and that Docker image is running nonstop. Uh, it is mm, something that we are really trying to get away from, but in this case, it's a 10-minute uh, dashboard puller where we run it every single minute to end up trying to simulate as live of a streaming data as possible, even though we only have a batch process, or at this time, we only had a batch process ready to go for it. Again, please don't. Please don't ever do some of the mistakes that we had in trying to end up getting this off the ground. Next iteration, we basically, or for this iteration, what we accomplished, we were able to end up getting things virtualized. We got it off of a singular PC. 
uh, we're able to end up creating a separation between our production and our test environment, as well as introducing our CICD pipeline with GitLab. And the big uh, component that we ended up having was Penna BI Live. Bold image of Hello World. Basically just to highlight our, our death main all the way through. Uh, but what iteration number one accomplished for us is a, com a competitor to, or a custom made competitor for Tableau. For all the people out there who were not exactly fans of Tableau's latency, uh, we tried to cap our latency with Tableau to about 15 minutes. Then there's other people out there who did not really appreciate the 15 minute latency. And this is what spawned our uh, Penna BI Live dashboards. Uh, they're Plotly dashboards in a separate Docker container that we ended up spinning up that are using and abusing our data puller scripts that we have out there and then creating a live visualization all the different areas that we have inside of the factory that stem from our VSM to general production to electrode assembly, formation VI, and onwards and above. These are now considered our legacy, but we cannot find a way to get away from them because if you guys have stakeholders who are very, very dead set on what they like and not wanting to change, this is exactly what you get. Iteration two um, was basically our improvement from Airflow one to Airflow two. This is where we finally started to get into some bit of a maturity. Our ETLs, as well as our DAG scripts that we have through and through, as well as just our Python code in general. We basically wanted to get away from the theme of getting away from the wild, wild west where you can have anything and everything, your SQL queries don't matter, what you end up naming your variables don't matter, there's zero issues with anything that we ended up having prior to this, and we found out in a nice crash and burn method after a while because our disk space went through the roof, and that was a nice chaotic mess. Um, if anyone has experienced disk space issues, let me know. I can probably walk through almost every single aspect of it because I've seen it all at this point. But the other point that we ended up finding is the more solutions that we ended up providing to people, the more questions that we ended up leading to. Because the moment that we give someone access to something, then it branches off into every single team and every single department wanting more and more and more. And it left us with the question, what now? What else can we end up getting ourselves into? And what mess and fun can we get into? So we started going through and actually giving ourselves a little bit more of a clear guidance and separating things out into small little tasks and small little chunks. Because if you guys have tried to debug a full-on script that is in a singular task, you probably ended up realizing that I have to go through hundreds, if not thousands of lines of code just to find out I have one line where, oh, I missed a punctuation, or hey, I misspelled something. And if you guys haven't found out yet, I already saw one misspelling on my slides, so I can tell you it happens more often than not. The next little bit that we ended up doing is since we do not or did not have a DBA at the time, we ended up becoming our own mess cleanup, um, where we wrote a Python script that was going through and creating these execution calls for us. So every single bit of our data mart had its way of cleaning up after itself every single morning. There's no need to let that data last for however long you really need it. Um, we did have data before that was there for multiple years. No one on Tableau or any of the data sources really need it for that long. So we found a way to end up going through every single table, giving ourselves our checks and balances and making sure that that database was going to be A-OK -okay in the future and that we try to stay around that 20 to 30 range when it comes to our disk space. 
The next uh, little cleanup of our own mess that we did is trying to clean up our XCOMs. And this is something that I think Mark was talking about. He's wanting to get rid of the Postgres operator and I'm probably the one and only advocate of it uh, in this entire session. But uh, it's one of the things that we found is what I like to call putting your toys away before you actually use it. Or in another sense, cleaning your vegetables before you put it into the refrigerator. I don't do it often in real life, but when it comes to ETLing, it makes things very, very nice and it cleans up your meta database to a T. The other little bit is we have our manufacturing execution system. And like I said before, we did not have a true DBA whatsoever. So we ended up becoming our own DBAs. We would end up writing the scripts to end up executing against our Oracle manufacturing system. And if you can kind of tell, and Ravi, I'm sorry, but I left your Microsoft in there, but, or your Microsoft ID in there, but, that being said, uh, this was a meta DB query that I ended up pulling against the Oracle system. Yes, you can augment it for certain users who you know who are going to end up pulling quite a bit information, but this ended up basically trying to catch anyone who was over an hour of their last call. Uh, we had issues with our manufacturing system in the past where we allowed interns, anyone who is brand new, who would do a lot of select star from stars, if you don't know, have at it. Have let, let somebody end up creating that query and try to do it off of the largest data set that you can think of. You will end up causing a CPU issue, I promise you. But that being said, ended up having a script that ended up pulling this exact query, trying to find the elapsed time that we were going from. Also the side, I liked calling this my snitch script. Pretty much it would end up catching whoever was there, killing their session. I also loved coming into the office and knowing exactly who was running these queries and then just watch their screens automatically throw a warning sign and said that their SQL query was terminated. But that's just me, loving of the anarchy. Alrighty, uh, the next little bit is the ramp up. Basically trying to create some sort of substance and some sort of a uh, visualization off of us. Here, this is a report that we end up creating. Not everyone is kind of privy to having that same email or access to that same Teams channel when it comes to their failures of the scripts. So every single morning, we decided we were going to query the meta database and see over the last 24 hours, how many times did a certain DAG fail and, how, and who exactly was the owner of it. And this lets us know, is there a underlying issue in their code? Is it something that is an upstream issue? Is it something that is just going on somewhere along the line? Are their tasks screwed up in any sort of way? But it gave us a really, really nice visualization in the mornings as to, okay, we don't have someone checking on production airflow nonstop, so let's go and see what exactly is underneath the hood and what is messing up with us. And then came iteration three. Iteration three is a, a nice little clean uh, cleanup where we finally started having a full-blown standards and the identity for our task groups. So the task groups, if you guys do not use them, please feel free, pick my brain. But if you are debugging through it, it is beautiful to not have a bevy of tasks to end up searching through. Go through check it out, um, and Astronomer has a boatload of documentation on it as well. And the last little bit is what the future necessarily holds for us. I've kind of talked about people, uh, or talked to some people about this prior, um, but we will be uh, putting our Airflow instance on Kubernetes. Our Kubernetes is able to slip between an OA and an FA network. If you guys don't know what OA is, it's basically the open availability, whereas FA is a firewall accessible network. And our Kafka, Kafka has the ability to basically go in between both, uh, which means that our Airflow will have the ability to stream data on command, as well as being able to host data from our Ignition or SCADA, SCADA Postgres and all of that will be going through an MQTT broker. 
uh, as well as we have the ability to end up sending data to Palantir, uh, which is our AWS type client that we will be hosting in the cloud. Aside from that, it's basically just a little bit more of Kubernetes. We plan on having Kubernetes on about, uh, or we have eight different versions of Kubernetes, all with 256 gigs, all ready to go, and having Airflow be the prime source of all of it. How do I do it?